Great, it's time to get your hands on writing your first TensorFlow.js model, so let's get to it. Head to the TensorFlow.js boilerplate project page and fork a new copy that you'll use to implement your custom model. For the first part of this tutorial, you'll import the housing data set that you just saw. Open up the index.html and replace the contents with what's shown on the next slide. Most of this code is exactly the same as the boilerplate you just remixed. However, note the subtle change to the script.js import. Here, you'll add a type attribute with a value of module as you'll be importing a JavaScript module that I defined that exposes the training data in an easy to use object. Okay, once that's updated, from this point on, you'll only need to edit code in script.js. First, you'll import the training data. Here, you can use JavaScript modules a new feature in JavaScript to import certain code from a file. Here, you import an object called training underscore data from a remote file called real-estate-data.js. In case you're wondering what's contained in this file, all I've done is converted the training data from a spreadsheet to JavaScript arrays as shown. Here you can see the inputs which are contained in a 2D array. Finally, at the end of this file, there's a new object called training underscore data that's exported, allowing other JS modules to then import this object and use it in any web app. Next, you can take the imported training underscore data object and create easy to read references to the training data inputs and outputs respectively. Remember here that the inputs are your features, the size and number of bedrooms, and the outputs are the house property values. At this point, it's wise to shuffle your two input and output arrays to avoid issues later in case your data was arranged in some order. TensorFlow.js has a handy utility function for this, which you can call via tf.util.shuffle combo, to which you pass the input and output arrays, which will shuffle them both in the same way so the inputs still correspond to the correct outputs. Now, once shuffled, you can convert the inputs to be a Tensor2D as these inputs are just an array of arrays, and the outputs to be a Tensor1D as the output values are just a single array of house values. Note that the order of the contents in the arrays is important. Element zero in the outputs directly corresponds to element zero in the input values. Next, to get the best results, you need to normalize your input values. Remember from chapter three, there are many ways to do this. You could choose to ensure all your numbers are in the range of zero to one, for example, which is what you're gonna do here. First, define a new function called normalize. It would take the tensor whose values you wish to normalize and an optional min and max argument. Now this optional min and max will be used when making predictions later on, instead of finding the min and max values every time from the original training data, which would be inefficient as there are thousands of rows of data. Once known, they can be stored and then just reused in future calls instead. The first line of this function uses a neat TensorFlow.js trick to automatically clean up tensors that were created that are not returned anywhere. tf.tidy allows you to call a function. In this case, you can use an inline anonymous function and any code written inside of that function will be monitored. Now, if any new tensors end up being created, they'll be automatically disposed of once the function returns, without you needing to call dispose yourself manually on each of them. The only tensors that survive tf.tidy are the ones that are returned in some way. One important thing to note here is that the function you pass to tf.tidy must not be an asynchronous function. So if that condition is met, tf.tidy can be a handy way to keep memory usage down automatically. Okay. Next, if a tensor of min values is passed, you just use that. Else, you can calculate the minimum values of each feature using tf.min. Here, you pass the tensor you wish to find minimum values for, and the second parameter specifies the axes. As you have a two-dimensional tensor, you can find the minimum values in terms of rows, columns, or both. If you do not specify an axes, it will just find the smallest value across the whole 2D array, both rows and columns, which is not what you want. Remember, to normalize data, you must do so for each set of input features individually, which is why you need to specify axis zero here, which is the first axis. So you find the minimum value for sizes of house and a minimum value for the number of bedrooms respectively. So yes, this will return a 1D tensor containing two values. 
Just to recap this visually to ensure you understand what's happening here, on the left is an example of an input tensor containing four example property inputs. On the right is what tf.min along with axis zero would produce. In this case, a 1D tensor where the first minimum value is the smallest property size it found and the second minimum value is the lowest number of bedrooms it found. In this example, it produces the numbers 550 and one. Now, if you do the same, but for finding max values, here you can use tf.max instead, but the principle is the same as the line before. This will again produce a tensor 1D with two values in it, one max value for each input feature in the original tensor. Then you can subtract the found minimum values from each feature's input values using tf.sub. As you can see, this takes the tensor you want to subtract values from, which remember is a 2D tensor of values in this case, and then the second parameter contains the values you want to subtract. In this case, min underscore values, which as you just saw, is a 1D tensor containing two values. To visually illustrate this, here you can see how the values 550 and one are subtracted from the original example tensor that's shown on the slide to produce the output on the right. Note how the 550 in the first column of min underscore values is only subtracted from the numbers in the first column of the 2D tensor and does not affect the numbers on the second column. In a similar fashion, the one is subtracted from the second column only, resulting in the new output tensor shown on the right hand side. And this is the beauty of working with tensors, as you're able to perform many calculations across multi-dimensional data with thousands of entries in just one line of code. And that transformation will happen as fast as possible as the tensors are optimized to run on hardware like your graphics card. Okay, back to the code. The next step in normalizing is to find the range of values for each feature. Here, you just need to subtract the min values from the max values, which will return a new 1D tensor containing the difference between these values for each feature found. Now you've got all the information you need to actually calculate the normalized values. Here, you divide the range underscore size tensor into the tensor containing the adjusted values of the inputs. This will output a new tensor where all values are in the new range of zero to one. Finally, you can return an object containing the tensors of interest. Here, you return the normalized values, the min values found, and the max values found. Remember, if you train a model using normalized values, then when a new prediction is needed, that must also be normalized, so storing the min and max values can help you to do that without needing to search through all the original training data again to find out what they are. So this makes it much more efficient. Next, you can use the normalized function you just wrote on your inputs the results of which will be stored in a constant called feature underscore results. At this stage, it's probably wise to inspect the values being returned to ensure they look correct and that you didn't make any mistakes implementing the normalized function. On the right, you can see the output that was printed to my console. Yours should be the same as you're using the same data. As there are thousands of rows of data, it just shows the first three and last three entries for the normalized tensor. You can also see the found min values of 432 square feet and zero bedrooms and the max values of 4,059 square feet and three bedrooms. Given that the first entry in your normalized inputs was a three bedroom house, you can see that its normalized bedrooms value is one, which seems correct as the normalized value of one represents the highest value possible. And the highest value of the bedrooms was three as shown by your max values in the tensor. Looks like everything is working pretty well. Finally, for any tensors that are not in a tf.tidy, don't forget to clean them up using dispose. Here, you can safely delete the original inputs underscore tensor you created, as you will now be training on the normalized values that are contained in the new tensor that was returned from the normalized function earlier on. Now that your data is pre-processed, it's time to actually write the code to define the model and implement a single neuron.